Hi, I'm Naomi Murphy and this is the Locked Up Living podcast where we talk with a wide range of people about harsh aspects of institutional life. We also explore some of the ways to overcome them and to grow and develop. I'm David Jones. So join us every Wednesday morning, six o'clock UK time for a fresh podcast. So today we're speaking with Ian Foxley. Ian's a retired army lieutenant colonel and is the founder and CEO of Paisia, the whistleblowing think tank. He had a long and distinguished army career during which he was formally recognised for communications warfare innovations he implemented. His charitable work since 2005 has involved constructing a school in Nepal. Post his service career and whilst working as a programme director for an Airbus Group subsidiary, he took a very risky course of action in exposing secret payments were being made to additional subcontractors in the Cayman Islands. These disclosures led to Airbus being fined £3.6 billion, the largest fine ever imposed on a commercial company in the world under a deferred prosecution agreement between the UK, USA and French law enforcement agencies. Since 2012, Ian has been involved in supporting whistleblowers, studying whistleblowing and creating policies to challenge organisational corruption. And we're really pleased you're able to join us today, Ian. Welcome. Hi, Ian. Great to uh, to meet you. Ian, this feels like a, a quite a timely period to have this conversation. But can you tell us where your story started and who were the main players? Um, it actually started in June 2010 when I took up a job um, following a proper you know um, recruitment process through the Sunday in Saudi Arabia working for a subsidiary of Airbus which is called GPT Special Project Management Limited Um, and the job was to become a program director for a brand new government to government um, contract Um, and so the customer was the UK MOD Um, And the end user was the Saudi Arabian National Guard. And the job was to modernize all their communications from radio through to um, microwave systems, the effect effectively a a, a comm system across the whole of Saudi Arabia and incorporating satellite communications and electronic warfare. Thank you. Uh, That's quite some uh, big players there, isn't it? So. Yes. (laughs) Yes. <laughs> how, did, how did you become aware that wrongdoing was occurring? You don't you don't just find the wrongdoing. You kind of trip over it by way of, of doing your job. You 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 are a new boy on the block coming into a new country that I've never worked in before, um, and in a new company and with a new bunch of people who are already extant in the role. But on the other side, you know, I knew my job. I knew all about all the different things I um, was was project managing, if in effect, because I'd used most of them in my 24-year military career, or in my commercial role after I left the army. I mean, I built two of the fiber optic networks around the UK, one for Talk Talk and one for for um, Tiscally, which then got rolled together. So you know, the prospect of building an, a a an intranet, a defence intranet across Saudi Arabia, not something that was unfamiliar. I'd done it before, you know, and I'd project manage that. So um, things that you come across don't fit with your training or your experience or eventually your values. And when you find one or two of them, you just go, oh, that's different. I, you know, I'm, I'm new to the system. I'm new to the process. I'm new to the country. But then there are some fundamental things that you, you find, like I um, went to the financial director and said, where's my budget? And he said, oh, you haven't got a budget. Um, we want you to do this on a cost basis and then we'll put a budget together. And I said, well, hang on. No, that, that doesn't make sense because you've bid for a contract through the MOD that's been awarded to you. It's a two billion pound contract. You must have put together a budget when you'd forecast your, what you were bidding in for. And therefore, you must have had some shape and idea of what you were doing. He said, single basis. You know, and you suddenly are, hang on, that goes against defence procurement rules because anything over 150 million has to be competitively let. So what's happening here? 
and then I found certain projects that were going on which just didn't make sense. Nobody had actually thought out the logical sequence of, you know, what you were doing or should be doing within a program of that magnitude. When I took over, I, I then found out that I was the third within six months. Now, you might you might excuse the first one because it might have been someone who was extant who had been promoted into the role and was unfit to do the job which actually was the case because he'd come from mechanical engineering. He was the MD of an automotive parts company who happened to know the financial director. And he stepped aside and they, they got a, a, um, a guy with a project, a, a project management PhD who they said to me he didn't, he didn't work with people. He was, he was an academic, not good with people. And I didn't find that to be true eventually. When I did some digging, he'd, he'd actually got out because he'd worked out what they were doing and, and got himself out. But they got me and then, and then, you know, but even so, that's just another trigger. And eventually sufficient triggers were there. And then I came across a, um, a major contract that we were letting, the first of the major projects. And there was a line within it that I'd seen before in the small projects, but in the small projects, it looked OK because the magnitude of it was not great. And then when I, I came to um, this particular contract, I found that it was um, that extra line was was um, actually about one and a half million. And I can actually show you, I think, the um, the uh, contract. Um, I've got it here. So if I show you this, that was the actual contract for um that i signed or wouldn't sign off it got given to me and over here these are the the signatures and the dates but you won't find mine there because these dates actually are the day after i left the country because i saw this and i raised my eyebrows and asked questions about you know who we were paying one and a half million to here this is um this is the sign off document for authorization to expend money on the project, on this so particular who, project. Ian, can I just ask who was buying from whom in this? So in this in this particular case, we, the British government, on behalf of the Saudi Arabian National Guard, are letting a contract to a subcontractor, which happens to be Airbus, by the way. Um, so they'd mm -hmm. they'd they'd run a competition and they'd won their own competition. So there's another little questionable bit of conflict of interest there. And what they're buying for nine and a half million Saudi rials, uh, sorry, for um, 77 million rials, which is about 12 million pounds, is they're buying here a, a, um, a lorry based headquarters or, or a number of headquarters that you can drive into the desert and it would be um, uh, effectively if you look at that a modular headquarters that was all singing all dancing filled with you know telecommunications equipment but good enough for the king of Saudi Arabia to walk into or the crown prince to run his operation from there so this is this is you know the top end of what you could buy in the modern world to provide a field headquarters and this project had about five or six different of those headquarters, which we would interlink with modern communications and SACCOM. So the overall total is, is 77 million rials, but nine and a half of that, which is equivalent to one and a half million pounds, is actually going offshore. Going offshore. So you then have to say, I didn't know that at the time. All I knew was that I had a subcontractor who was going to get paid one and a half million for something I didn't know about. And I didn't know about the subcontractor. And then when you start asking the commercial director and the finance director um, who, you know, look after the money, what is this? You very nervous people who get very aggressive very quickly. Um, there we go, that's, that's the background to it. So what I did was, was eventually, it wasn't, didn't take me long, but eventually as a matter of a week or 10 days as I was digging around to this and things were getting difficult in country with it within the company 
I went to the British Brigadier and said, because we have a we have a British liaison team there, who was run down with that, and they were stitched into you know, close liaison positions with the headquarters, with the general, with the National Guard, and out in the regions with the brigadiers out across Saudi Arabia. And I said, look, um, I've got a problem with the, this contract. You know, we've only got two major military contracts in Saudi Arabia. We have the one for uh, selling Tornado or now Typhoon aircraft uh, run by British Aerospace. And this one, which was run by Airbus. I've come across this thing and I'm really uncomfortable with it. And he said, have you got evidence? And I said, well, not enough at the moment. He said, well, bring me the evidence and I'll do something. So I went away and, and there's a long story about how I got the evidence, but I did get the evidence and I sent it to him the next day. And then I waited for him to, to do something and um, nothing happened. And I thought, this is funny. And about four hours later, the managing director said, uh, you've been sending documents to the MAD, what are they? And I said, well, I've got them out of this account and it's proof of corruption. And he said, you should have come to me. And I said, I can't, your signature's on it. You know, your, your name's on the bank authorizations and the checks. And, uh, and in the office at the time was, was the HR director, who was a Saudi princess, a senior Saudi princess and, and first cousin of the of National Guard, a guy called Prince Mutev bin Abdullah, and um, niece of the king. And he turned to her and he said, well, I can, you know, I can accuse you of, of um, stealing company information and I can call the police and have you arrested. And he's, can't I, it's Nora, Princess Nora Sara. And, um, and she said, yes, certainly, Jeff. And he said, well, go and stop all access to the computer system, IT. And, and um, she picked up her diary and left the room. And I suddenly thought, you're in serious you're in serious trouble here because if she does call the police and says you know i'm a saudi princess and you you've got to come and arrest this guy they're going to come and arrest you and you're going to go somewhere you do not want to go and you probably aren't coming back so get out quick so i got it is the concise version it gets a bit um, James Bondy in certain places, but there we go. I can see that. I mean, Ian, firstly, I'm struck by what a brilliant description you've just given of expertise in action. You know, your knowledge and expertise, spotting that in the, the middle of those figures. It's uh, extraordinary. Secondly, I'm struck by what a scary situation you were suddenly in. Um. Yeah, I, I mean, I didn't think the brigadier would betray me. But what I later found out was that he had rung the Ministry of Defence and said, I've got this, what do I do? And they said, give it back to the company. And I think to a great extent, to, to, be, to be straightforward about it, I got thrown to the wolves. Um, they thought the company would do a deal. And, 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 and I remember I didn't know what's going on. I just you know I've come across something and, and I've declared it. Do I think internally and confidentially and suddenly find myself betrayed? And then you're threatened, and I think with a lethal threat. Um, I mean, this is this is not just life changing, it's life threatening. And what kicks in, I think, is military training. I mean, I, I, I've been counter terrorist trained and, and you know, I'm sensing that. Um, and you you remain very calm and you remain very focused and you think at a million miles an hour and it's about is about analyzing the risk and mitigating the risk and the nearest i mean the old expression of the nearest crocodile to the canoe beat that one over the head and then deal with the others as they line up um and then work out how to get yourself to a safe place a safe position and, and then go forward from there. I mean, it's not retreat, it's called tactical withdrawal in the military world, <laughs> you know. Um, but yeah, yeah but it sound, I mean, it sounds it sounds terrifying, but also you can nearly hear that you just went into a practical, pragmatic mindset of, all right, what do I need to do? Um, 
you know, and become quite logical in order to get out of the situation. But it sounds incredibly frightening and dangerous. Uh, you recognise the threat and then you deal with the threat. And then you relax when you can. I mean, remember when I got, I, I, I caught the plane out that night. I mean, the MOD team, I think, realised that when they found out what I'd been threatened with, they thought, I think that's a step too far. We're not going to allow you to get killed. We're not going to be party to that. And they got me out or helped me get out that night. And the degrees of, you know, you get to a safe house, you sit there for a few hours, you work out which way to go. They say, go this way because it's the safest way and we all know what's happening. But we, I remember a colonel drove me to, to the airport and I went through and he shook my hand in front of, of passport control. And I went through and he, he said, I can't come through with you, but I'm going to stand on that platform up there and, and watch you. And if you're grabbed, they'll do it here because it's an electronic passport system. And the princess and, and all passes and permits and um if, if they grab you my first phone calls to the brigadier my second one's to the ambassador at least we'll know where you are and then you gulp you shake his hand you smile and you walk forward into passport control where i mean and you're you're in a tr you're in a trapped environment there you've got to be cool you've got to keep your wits about you get through you breathe a sigh of relief and you know smile upwards and and then you lose yourself in a crowd don't go where they think you'll go lose yourself remain inconspicuous um find somebody else to give you cover if you can because they're looking for a single so be part of a crowd um get on the aircraft and and text him when doors close and then get the biggest gin and tonic you can or whiskey off of the and, and, then, and then you can release. And then coming into Heathrow, you're seven hours in the aircraft. And if she's really going to do something, she'll have wired someone and there'll be someone coming to put the tabs on you at the other end. So when you come out of Heathrow, you ramp up again and you, you, you switch on, you have a, a kind of internal radar. So you start scanning, you start looking for who's around and who might be paying in. Hearing very not, and then don't take obvious routes. Don't go near a railway station or a platform where you can get easily nudged off the edge. You know, I, I took a bus from Heathrow to Reading, and from Reading I took a train to another station, and and from that station I called my parents. I didn't Emma, my wife, didn't even know I'd left the country. Um, and then hide away for a couple of days until you can really write a report about what it doing more and say we're going and i've got something you ought to know about and that's what happened it's really over interesting as you days. talk about it ian because you're using the present tense and i wonder how <laughs> how oh, much man. that still fit you know how how much does that feel like the past and how much does that still feel like it's i can remember i can remember it's so vivid i mean i i i, I know exactly how i felt because that was and, and that was that was just exhaustion and that was just relief of of crossing another barrier so you're in somewhere safe and you can actually stop and relax and 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 then it unwinds slowly i mean psychologically i've had a long time to think about this now but i hadn't realized that the the, the tension had been building over about a month and a half peaks for a very short period of time and then you get you get safe and then there's a kind of reaction to that it's a kind of releasing the valve and you you suddenly get flooded with emotion um and then it's a recovery period and that recovery period i think takes about six months to a year at least certainly six months so yeah like banging how, how far how far did you think the uh, british government and forces were involved at the time i didn't think they were involved at all um and it didn't become apparent until i started you know running through my brain of, of 
hang on, what happened there? How did how did they find out? How did they, you know, and then I got told that that the brigadier had been told by the MOD to hand it back. And the next question is, why? Hey, come on, you know, I've just I've just uncovered with first hand knowledge of of you know millions of pounds being paid out to the Cayman Islands to secret subcontractors. You know, and and I presume from there on in back to generals. And I mean, I didn't know who it was going to exactly, but it certainly wasn't wasn't back to the MOD. Um, so why would the MOD hand it back? Not surely. And then you run into the horrible thought of, oh my God, their partners, they're in on it, or or are they? Or you know, what's happened? I don't know. I have suspicions. And I have, have, you know, I don't have a prima facie case, but I have a lot of questions that need answering. So I didn't find out about the MOD. I mean, you, you draw a line between knowledge and you don't actually get knowledge which will stand up in court until you've actually got documentation, you know, word of mouth is not good enough to stand up in a court of law and accuse the Ministry of Defence of, of systemic corruption over 35 years. I mean, that's, that's an, an amazing accusation to make against, against you know, five different regimes flipping between Labour to Conservative and back again three or four times. How are, you going to, how are you going to sustain that in a court of law? How are you going to persuade barristers to argue your case unless you've actually got evidence? And the evidence didn't actually turn up until the sentencing remarks of GPT when they were actually put in court and pleaded guilty. And the facts of the 2021. I mean, that's 11 years later. And that's the first time we actually had clear-cut evidence, knowledge, hard knowledge. And it was only because the, the Crown Court judge actually said and HMG facilitated the, the, the payments. And the last trial, which was finished 10 days ago, of the individuals actually acquitted the individuals because they were shown in court during that court case that Her Majesty's government had had authorised the corrupt payments. And that's yet to come out in the in the, 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 the case. And we're, you know, there's a number of, of bodies now, NGOs, who are calling for a public inquiry. And I support that. You know, I think I think you 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 in the public interest, we have got to get to the bottom of this. So how did that uh, develop then Ian? Um, you've described as how you got from Heathrow back to your home through by taking a circuitous route. Um, did your awareness of the situation develop more from that point onwards? Well, the, the next thing I did was I rang, I rang the MOD headquarters. Remember, this project is run from my bit of the army in communications. Um, so, so I never know. I knew the general. The general was at school with me. Um, and I rang his office and his PA referred to him. And he then said, well, will you go and see my commercial director? And I set up an appointment with him. And a few days, a few days later, I went down to, to Corsham in Wiltshire. And I had an interview with him. And I took with me a, a I wrote a, a staff paper. Good old background. This is what I found. Here are my deductions. Here's my conclusions, recommendations, and also a, a disc with the um, all the electronic data on it and the documentation, but in electronic form. And I gave them to him and I said, "Look, this is what I found. Um, you're the commercial director in the superior headquarters of this project, and if you don't know about this, then okay." I, I'm giving the proof. You don't do something with this. You are complicit. And I will go to the papers and I will go to the serious thought office and I will accuse you as well as everybody else. So you've got five days. Let me know. And 
the next week I got a phone call from the MOD fraud squad who said, can we have a chat, please? And I had a chat with them. And um, and then they took it to the serious fraud office, or they had a look and took it to the serious fraud And the next major step was actually um, about a year and a half later. And I can actually show you that as well, um, I think. If I just share this slide with you. There it is. Just... Sorry, this one there. What that lays out is the chronology of what happened. So I blew the whistle in December 2010. I then took it to the SFO. I then wrote to the business ministry and queried how, how the Defence and Security Organisation Export Guarantees um, Department were funding SANCOM. And then in 2012, about March, PricewaterhouseCoopers um, completed their audit of GPT at the behest of, of um, Airbus. And they put out a big notification, a big marketing and PR thing saying, you know, no proper in payments by GPT. And there was a parallel organization called Ethic Intelligence who certified Airbus's anti-corruption compliance processes. And I wrote to the director of the SFO and I said, um, you know, have you seen this? And if you look at who the C is in Pricewaterhouse Coopers, it's actually Coopers and Librand who were merged with Pricewaterhouse. And they were the auditors of GPT um, historically back through the project before KPMG. So if there was any history of corrupt payments, I, do you think they'd, they'd, they'd declare them and do you think they'd be objective? And he said, do you know, I agree with you. And he launched a formal criminal investigation into, um, into Airbus. And that went on. That that took till till actually um, about 2016. If you look down to about April 2016, what happened in between was that that triggered a uh, a an investigation into Airbus declared um, ten different other cases of corruption across aircraft sales. And, and the reason that Airbus have have a communications wing is that Airbus also do satellite. You know, they 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 were European aerospace and defence and space systems, and they provide the satellite coverage uh, and connectivity for British. So out of that span, other communication systems, but that's separate from the aircraft manufacture and operations. But they they found that corruption was systemic across the whole of Airbus, and they were then fined, or they 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 completed a deferred prosecution agreement with the French, the the, the Americans, and and the SFO, and were fined three point six and three point six billion euros. By the way, it's it's not the um, benefits that we got out of that was about eight hundred and eighty million pounds into the UK exchequer. And then at the same time, and I didn't know this, but GPT declared guilty or, or, or started a plea bargain with the SFO and declared that they were guilty of corruption. And it took another three years for the Attorney General to agree with um, the SFO. And um, GPT actually went into court in April 2021 and were fined 28 million pounds and 2.2 million costs. So, you know, the overall benefit <laughs> to the UK exchequer from what I triggered is just under a billion pounds. So, you know, did my bit. No, but they, they, um, they exist because there's a liability and they're not allowed to dissolve the company. It's still it's still there, but it's, it, it's non-operational, but it is still in existence. And that's because there was another trial. So we, we had the, the deferred prosecution with the group. We had the guilty, the trial and the guilty verdict on GBT. And then we went into a trial 
after another two years of the, the managing director of direct and senior corrupt payments in the Cayman Islands. And what happened there was that we had a first trial, it got stopped, and then we had a second trial because it became apparent that there was a lot of evidence of MOD and business department involvement and authorization of payments. And there was a great reticence within business departments or, or government departments to disclose and a lot of hard fighting by the SFO to get them to disclose the information. And then you had thousands, and I mean thousands of pages of documentation for the SFO to go through. And eventually, um, last month on the 28th of March, I think it was, the jury in the last trial declared that the two individuals were not guilty. They were acquitted of corruption on the first charge. But the managing director was found guilty of taking bribes while he was a civil servant. Working on the case, he took backhanders and was jailed for 30 months and fined a total of about um, £148,000. So he went to jail. He's in jail now. Um, and he's got a massive fine to pay. And I think it's a fair because the people in the case, I believe, were the government departments and the politicians and the senior civil service who allowed, facilitated and propagated the corruption since the initiation of the project in 1978. So there is a question to ask about what they've been doing on behalf of us, the taxpayers, and by what policy and what should be done about it. So do you think... Do you think the questions you'd raised and you'd highlighted, do you think they've been satisfactorily resolved or is there more to do? Um, number one, I'm vindicated in what I saw, what I found, what I blew the whistle on. It's now proven fact that I was right and the, co the contract was, was corrupt. Those who were responsible have been revealed. Whether they've been held accountable is a different matter because the individuals have been held accountable. And although they were complicit, they were not found to be complicit in the court of law. But the, the jury could not say you're, you're, you're guilty, but in a slightly different way, because that's not what the charge was. The charge was corruption and they found that they had had hired them to act the way they did, but that doesn't answer the question of whether they were complicit to corruption. But that's be it as it may. What has not been done yet and remains to be done is to hold the government departments accountable and get them to explain in public what they were doing, why they were doing it, how they were doing it, and on what authority. And in a, in a parallel to the post are we actually going to hold individuals accountable, personally accountable, or are we again going to draw the veil of, oh, it was a civil service, oh, it was the government, over the part played by the individual? The, you know, individuals and very, I mean, the ser most senior level in this country, you cannot sign off hundreds of millions of pounds of bribery with a brief Secretary of State, if not Cabinet level. And, and therefore, we have got to have a very good, hard look at our own politicians, our elected representatives, and the institutions that they're running, and the senior civil service, because it's, it's a matter of principle and agent all the way down. You know, that the, the politician is the initial principle, the senior civil servant is the agent then implement what the politician asks for. That's his job. So he becomes the principal and the civil servants below him become the agents. And then you engage with the commercial organization, GPT or Airbus or their, their predecessors. And they become the principals and the, the, the commercial organization becomes the agent. And then the managing directors 
and the directors become the principal, the directors become the agent. And that's when you get down to the individual on the ground who is actually the business manager or the business development manager, et cetera, who says, oh, but you told me to. So there is a chain of responsibility that needs to be clearly laid out. And somebody has to put their hand up and say, I'm responsible. You know, it's the same in the post office. It starts with the it starts with the the, the political will of the leader of the organization, then it trickles down. And at what point in time do we hold individuals accountable? That's the real question. Well, I think you're totally right. It cuts across other sectors as well. Just, I mean, we have obviously, a, you know, the charge of, of corporate manslaughter, but I don't think anyone's ever been convicted of it. And yet, you know, I think what you see happening in the NHS, again, is hiding behind the trust rather than individuals being held accountable. And so people, to some degree, seem to get off scot-free. So in the NHS, they'll then go and be the CEO of another trust um because they they are not having to hold their hands up to, to what they happening. take a they take a golden handshake and they they pop up you know two counties down the road in charge of another trust because they've got senior level experience what they don't admit to is that actually they they, they penalize somebody who stood up and said you've got malpractice going on or bad management or and they they shoot the messenger and 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 hence we come back to par parhesia you know this idea of of the powerful guaranteeing protection to the vulnerable in exchange for the truth and that's the ancient principle that we've forgotten and we really need to implement it back in this country at the moment you know you can if you want to take the money and the status for being the head of the organization then at least take responsibility when it goes wrong as well you know if if i'm commanding officer of a regiment and i have been if something goes back and i have been negligent in not ensuring the paymaster has done his job properly and checked the accounts and there's a deficit of money <coughs> i'm actually responsible if we lose weapons or my soldiers go out and are so badly behaved i am responsible and I put my hand up and say, fine, I resign my commission. I will go. I don't see that that same moral rectitude in, in civilian life, certainly not in the post office. Though. No, and I, no, no, and I, I think that's that's there across all. You know, if you look at all of the industries that have been privatised, that when they're in, the, you know, they're in the public sector and it seems they're sold off. And then what happens is the any benefits go to the shareholders, but any risk is still held by the state. You know that we they get bailed out, water companies get bailed out, or what have you. So it it doesn't really work both ways, does it? That that idea of accountability and responsibility. But I'm glad you brought up Parhesia, Ian, because I, you know I'm delighted that you've had a good outcome in terms of being vindicated for for the part that you've played. But I, we're, at da we're in danger of skipping out this really important bit in the middle where I can't imagine that your life was easy once you returned home. And I wonder if you could share anything about what happened after you, after you came home. You know, did you feel safe? Did you get did you get much support from any of these organisations? What, what happened? Um, well, I didn't go home to see my wife for about two or three days until after I'd, I'd, I'd formulated everything. Um, and actually, no, I didn't feel safe. If I mean, I wrote a paper, it was a good paper. It went to a brief cabinet briefing paper. I know it did, because um, I'd seen the, the, the briefing note. And, um, and I actually wrote two covering letters, and I dispatched one overseas and um, another one in the UK to third parties. Um, I can reveal now the third parties were two of my brothers who are also ex-army officers, because they would understand the process. And they would they would read the military staff on the covering letter was a little note saying you know if i'm found i am not suicidal if i'm found up against a tree or on a railway line you know you now know what has happened and this must go to the sfo don't allow them to bury this so that actually in retrospect shows my mental state at the time you know i i, I and if you look at you look at what happened to, to 
Khashoggi, you know, you, you get a thing that, you know, you've crossed them and you've stopped, as in my case, about 300 million pounds going to offshore bank accounts. They're not going to take that lightly. You know, if they can, if they can shut you up and close you down, they will. Or you will, you know, if I'd gone into Riyadh, Nick, I wouldn't have come out for 10 years. There'd have been some trumped up charge of, of you know, producing illegal booze or, or, or you know, um, or, or you'd have taken a one way trip into the desert and you wouldn't come back. You know, I'm, I'm pretty clear about the fact that, you know, it's a ruthless old world out there. And that, I think, was a dangerous time. I didn't go home because I, I knew they knew where I lived and I knew they knew where my wife was and my children were. And if I'm not in contact and they don't know, then, then you know, they've got to chase me. They can't, they can't. And I went in community with GPT because they couldn't bend me. Um, and then once you'd taken it to the SFO, I also went to Paris, by the way, I rang up the, the group compliance director and went for an interview with him in Paris. And he was nice as pie, gave me a lovely cup of Earl Grey tea and half an hour and showed me the door, you know. Um, and he said, well, let's see what the MD of GPT does. And he allowed the MD in contact, you know. So he has a duty of care because he knew what I knew. He had a copy of the information. And he did nothing. Um, so, you know, I think they've got a duty of care. If, if somebody comes to me in my organisation and says, you know, one of your squadron commanders is bullying that boy or girl, I'm not going to wait and say, you know, let me deal with it. <laughs> you step in. You have a duty of care to all of your employees. You can't just advocate, you know, wait and see no so i think the threat diminished once it became public and then if they do come and get you it's it's got to be out of revenge it's not going to be this this, this you're not going to get the payment so what's the point and, and somebody i mean i know putin has this policy of defenestration of people like me but but you know um I think that in this country, people like Airbus pulled back from that. There was another whistleblower who, who was threatened within Airbus. And I have a, an email from a compliance officer that got involved who actually said, um, I, will, I will agree with and under, understand corruption if it benefits by not being killed. And if anything happens to you, I will, you know, blow the whistle myself. So, you know. It had happened before. So, Ian, you, you had an exemplary career prior to speaking up. In fact, speaking up is entirely consistent with um, the whistleblowers, typically having had a lot of integrity about they performed their role. But we know that after speaking up, whistleblowers commonly suffer recrimination. Was this part of your experience? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You can't get a job. You, you, you the defence sector is actually quite a closed circuit. You know the people around and you are known and you know your, your peers as a revolving door that goes from the MOD out into the commercial firms and the, and the big commercial firms, you know, the Lockheed Martins, the, the, the General Dynamics, you know, the Taluses and the Airbuses. Um, and once you're known, once word goes around, it around very quickly, um, certainly on something of this magnitude, you are not going to get employed. And I got told, you know, um, I'm sorry, no, you like, you trust you, but but we've got other government contracts and we've got relationships in the Middle East and you're too hot to handle. You know, we, we can't employ you. Sorry. Um, and how often do you beat your head against the door? You know, you, you go around as many as you can, you, you ring up as many friends or contacts at work. And I had a fairly extensive network. Um, and the answer's always the same. And you then have to say, well, you know, I've still got expenditure going out and, and you know, we had a, an employment tribunal that cost us £30,000 in savings, went nowhere because it was ruled to be out of jurisdiction, which was a failing in the law. And then 
what do you do? You you try and find something. And very luckily, I I found to a small startup in 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 a video live video surveillance company that that needed to get into defence and security, and they took me on as a business development director and and helped me, which was great. And eventually, I did get a job. I got a job hand, uh, not quite handed to me. I, I went through all the interview process to be the head of of a national emergency planning centre. And um, rolled, and they were doing some some uh, due diligence. And the cabinet office, who were the sponsor, turned around and said, "Oh no, um, you can't give it to him because one of the major contracts that we have is five million a year from the Saudi Arabian National Guard, and it becomes too embarrassing if he becomes the head of the organisation." And so I suddenly find that you know the cabinet office. You know, to whom you know it should have been the people that I'd blowing the whistle to had stopped me getting a another decent job. What was that like emotionally? No, oh, horrible, horrible. What, what, yeah. Really disappointing, actually. I mean, and and you 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 kind of say, I give up. Why 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 do it? And if you say, right, I'm not going to get a job. What am I going to do? You've got to change direction. Again, it's risk management and mitigation. How do you deal with it? So, okay, I'd been I'd been talking about, been talking about um, you know what we should be doing and fighting corruption, and I uh, decided to go and study it. So to drop into academia and perhaps become a, a lecturer. I'd been a lecturer at Staff College beforehand. One of my appointments was was I was a member of the directing staff in communications and electronic warfare and and actually ethics as well in staff college and, and um, I went to local university outside york and found the center for applied human rights and studied a masters in human rights looking at survival strategies of whistleblowers and how you can take those strategies and apply them to other human rights defenders and uh, at the end of that, my my thirst for that hadn't quite been assuaged, so I went straight into a PhD to um, to look at why people do not speak up because I know why people speak up, but it always plagued me as to why people don't speak up, and especially in, a, in a, an environment like mine where we'd all had the same education background, training, experience and should have behaved the same way, and yet didn't. So what are the critical factors that, that, that draw that difference and what lessons, what generic lessons can we bring out about why people don't speak up? I think we've come across lots of people in the course of our podcast who are scared to speak up because they're concerned about you know, the effects on their career, which is something you just uh, touched on. It's very common. But hopefully you're going to come back and talk to us about that in more depth, Ian. Can I just say, I think you've given us a, a brilliant uh, description and insight into the interactions between our political system, the government stroke civil service system, and the people they engage with commercially. I think you've done that so uh, powerfully. But in addition, you've given us, I think, something rather rare, which is a description of the activity, the thinking of a very good military mind, which arises from your military training and uh, experience as well. I think we don't often get that portrayed, you know. I think we're much more used to envisaging some kind of Colonel Blimp but you're not at all. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank, you. thank you. I think I think um, there are three key aspects of me that 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 I think uh, shape what, what I do and how I'm um, And and I know there are there are shades of that, but 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 within every Catholic, there's a very hard core of of values. It's it's drummed into you, beaten into you when you're when you're very young, and it, you never lose it, and or you seldom lose it. Secondly, I'm a rugby player, 
and I'm quite used to you know getting into the fray and not dodging the tackle. And thirdly, I did parachute selection when I was 34 and commanded a parachute unit for two years and had immense fun. And the thing about that is that you are a people apart. You are those willing to take a blow and get up and fight again and keep getting up and fighting again. You know, put yourself on the bridge at Arnhem and, and you've got certainly when you've got nowhere else to go. So get on with it, you know, and take them down with you. You know, if you're, if you're coming for me, don't expect an easy time. Thank you. But from what you've been describing, Ian, it doesn't sound that you got a lot of support anywhere along the line. Did you? Um, yeah, only... The, within the institutions, the only support I got was from within the Serious Fraud Office. And there was one particular director, David Green, now Sir David Green, who actually understood where I was coming from, what I was doing. And his team, I think, actually have been dogged in their commitment of seeing it right the way through. And I, I give them all credit for that. On the personal level, there's a small group of friends and family who have stood by me. And in particular, I mean, my, my, my wife, you know, we've been married 36 years. I could not have done this without her. You know, because when life really comes at you and knocks you time and time again, you've got to have a rock that you cling to. And she's been fabulous. And, and yeah, actually, one of my conclusions of my master's, we decided this idea of, of on the rock face of life, you've got four handholds. And there's a climbing analogy that says you can take off one, but you've got to retain the other three to, to retain stability. And in life, you have four. You have home, health, work, and wealth. And when you're a whistleblower, the first one that goes is your work. The second one that goes is your wealth. The third one that goes is your health, certainly your mental health, because you're immense, and I mean immense stress. And the last one, the only one that keeps you hanging in there is that close network of friends and family who... who know you understand you and stand by you um and that's in my case that's true as well thank you well i think that's probably quite a good 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 well no maybe not but maybe we should just get one in about parhesia actually so just in terms of getting towards the end of the interview ian what's next for you and also the organization you founded parhesia can you say a little bit about that yeah, sure. Um, one of the things that, that Pahita came about really because I was having a discussion in the academic world about what I was going to do. And having worked out why people don't do things and having proven in the, the thesis that, that I know who knew about it in the government, one of the things I wanted to do was actually um, change the law about, about um, protection of whistleblowers. But to influence and get that done, you have to provide evidence. And evidence, where does evidence come from for policymakers? It actually comes from two places. It comes from the experience, people like me, who are experts, but only because they've done it. And secondly, from academics who have studied it for a long time. That's where, that's where we get expertise from. You listen to Radio 4, listen to the Today programme. That's, they're the people they bring in to talk about it. Um, so studying the PhD and the Masters, I knew all the experts. And what I found was that whistleblowing is a fairly niche segment. Um, so let's put them together and let's find out what, what the body of knowledge is and where the deficits are. What, where are the gaps? Where do we need to look in future? And where do policymakers need the evidence? And can we, can we get it researched or can we dig it out and take it to them to support the arguments of what needs to be done? And so that's what we did. That's why I put Parhesia together. And that's what we're doing now. And we've, we've 
we've been successful there. It's been going three years. Um, we need more funding because we're, <laughs> you know, we run on a shoestring. And Joseph Rowntree Charitable Trust have been great in, in, in funding us to date, but, you know, we're running out of that funding. Um, but we have we have got clauses into the the Economic Crime and Corporate Transparency Act, um, specifically about whistleblower protection under failure prevent to prevent, and um, we have contributed to the uh, view of whistleblowing framework, and we've 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 contributed to the the anti corruption strategy. We support the all party parliamentary group on on anti corruption and tax reform and fair business banking so yeah we we have a voice that is now listened to by the ministers and by the uh policy makers senior policy makers hopefully to to help shape the future to make the world a safe place thank you ian that's a really powerful story but good nice to hear there's a good outcome at the end of it and also hear about you I haven't finished yet <laughs> i haven't finished i've got a few things left to do <laughs> we haven't we haven't changed the law yeah but 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 i mean in the immediate future the 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 i have i have a civil claim for compensation against the mod and the the business department i've got to argue that through um, I want to ensure that um, we have a public inquiry into government departments and, and how they've handled, you know, overseas payments on corrupt um, or, or corrupt payments on, on defence procurement contracts. And I have another question, and the question is about proceeds of crime. If the government of corruption, as was shown in the most recent trial, and if they took twenty eight million pounds in fine off the company, how do they hold on to that if they're complicit under the proceeds of crime act? And should they? It's not taxpayers' money, it was a confiscation on the proceeds of crime. I think they should hand that up to whistleblowing charities to put in place processes of therapeutic counselling, judicial support employment support and further research into whistleblowing um, to actually benefit society and help make the world a better place. Don't hang on to the ill-gotten Ill gains. You don't deserve them. Give them up. There you go. That's what I want to do. Good point. Good. Thanks very much indeed, Ian. It's been a real pleasure um, and very illuminating talking with you. It's been a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you very much. Yeah, I really enjoyed that, Ian. Thank you.